Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. We've come today to be in his presence. His presence has been wonderful this morning together. His mercies are fresh and new every morning to our lives. He's so good to us, so merciful, so kind, so gracious. You and I are not here today because of anything that we've done, but we're here today because the grace of Jesus Christ has redeemed our lives, transformed us, and aren't you glad he's continuing to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ, his son? Well, a couple of weeks ago, I shared with you from the passage on grace and truth, and this morning, I want to follow up that message this morning, and we're going to take some time today, and we're going to talk about living in grace. It's one thing to receive grace at the point of salvation, to have our sins forgiven. As the Bible uh, records our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's one thing to have that experience, but it's another thing to learn to live in His grace. And there's a lot of people who have received forgiveness at the point of salvation, but they struggled with living in grace. And so that's where we're going to head today. You know, forgiveness is a word that is fundamental to the Christian faith. Everything that Jesus Christ did on the cross for your life and for my life is rooted and it's founded in the truth of forgiveness. I'm going to ask Pastor Jeremy and Hallie if they'll come. They're going to help me for just a minute. And you might give them a hand as they're coming. (laughs) I figured he would ham it up and she would just have to follow behind him. But... (laughs) You know, I'm sure there's times in their house that there have been times that Pastor Jeremy, before leaving, would look at Hallie and he'd say, you know, uh, Hallie, while I'm gone, I want you to take the trash out today and I want you to make sure that it's, it's uh, taken out and everything's cleaned up. And, and so she said, yeah, I'll do that, you know, like a good, wonderful daughter that she is. And Uh, She'd do anything for her dad, and so Jeremy leaves, comes back a few hours later and walks in the kitchen, and what do you think he finds in the kitchen still? It's the trash. And Jeremy walks up to her and says, Hallie, I thought I told you to take out the trash, and you said that you would. And she says, oh, Dad, I forgot to take out the trash. Will, Dad, will you forgive me? For not taking out the trash. And Jeremy, of course, being a good father, he says, of course I'll forgive you. And, and he does so. In fact, we've got Josh, if you have, we've got a picture of Hallie taking out the trash. <laughs> being the good daughter that she is. <laughs> now, imagine with me a little farther down the road. Hallie is out, her and several of her friends, and they're playing a game. And Everybody's having a great time, and Jeremy happens to look over, and when he does, he sees Hallie sitting on the sidelines. Everybody else is having a great time, and she's sitting on the sidelines, shoulders slumped over, and looking sad and discouraged, and Jeremy walks up and says, Hallie, what's wrong with you? What's, What's going on? You look so sad. Everybody else is having a great time. Why are you so sad? And she said, Dad, Dad, I just can't get over the trash. You asked me to take out the trash, and I forgot. Dad, can you ever forgive me for not taking out the trash that day? And Jeremy says, well, honey, now I'm sure Jeremy would have to play a little prank in the middle of it and make her squirm a little bit. But he would say, of course, honey, I forgive you, and that's no big deal. You need to just let that go. Well, I want you to blast forward a little bit then into the future. And we find Hallie is graduating from college. And as she is marching past the stage with all of her uh, friends and she passes the mic, she stops at the mic and she says, Dad, Dad, I know you're out there somewhere. Dad, I just want to tell you I'm really sorry about the trash. (laughs) Really sorry. Really, Dad, can you please forgive me? I didn't take out the trash that day. Well, let's blast forward a little bit farther into the future. And 
Jeremy is at the hospital, and Hallie and her husband have just, and you didn't even know you had a husband yet, did you, honey? <laughs> her and her husband are there, and they've had their first child, and Jeremy is a proud grandpa. Uh, standing beside the bed there with her, he looks at her, and he says, you know, Hallie, this is a wonderful moment, isn't it? And she says, it sure is, Dad. She says, but Dad, you know, there's something that's still really bothering me. Dad, I'm just really sorry about the trash. I, I just, I feel so much guilt and so much shame because you asked me to do that and, and I forgot to, and Dad, I'm so sorry. I, I know I've asked you before, but I want to ask you one more time. Dad, will you forgive me for not taking the trash out that day? Thank you, guys. Why don't you give me a hand? You know, at this point, I would think that Jeremy would begin to think in his heart and mind, maybe my daughter really hasn't settled into receiving my forgiveness. Maybe my daughter hasn't been able to come to a place where she can receive it fully in her life. Could it be today that some of you are just like his daughter? Could it be that some of you have not settled in your heart and in your mind that you've been forgiven by your heavenly father? Could it be that some of you are walking about with the weight of the trash and you're continuing to walk in a life of guilt and shame instead of the freedom and the joy that God has for your life? Now, the truth is today, God loves all of us unconditionally with a one-of-a-kind love. You have never locked eyes with a person that doesn't matter to God. You've never seen anyone that God doesn't love unconditionally and completely. God tells us that he loves us, and then he backs it up. He sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins that we might be forgiven, and Jesus did. It's accomplished all the work of forgiveness on the cross. He's a God who forgives. He's a God who makes promises what he says he will do. And everything he does is exactly what he said. Because of that, you and I can stand on his promises. Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 4, 5, and 8. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy. Aren't you glad he's rich in mercy this morning? God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace. Somebody say grace. grace. It is by grace you have been saved. Verse 8, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no man can boast. Titus 3, 4 and 5. But when the kindness of God, excuse me, in the kindness and the love of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Aren't you glad of his mercy today? So thankful for his mercy in my life and his kindness. The gospel is a message of grace. Now, grace means undeserved favor. That's what we receive from Christ, undeserved favor. The Bible tells us in Romans 5 and 8 that while we were still sinners, that Christ died for us. When we weren't looking for him, he came looking for us. When we didn't want anything to do with him, yet he pursued us with his incredible love. When we didn't want anything to do with God, he came to this earth did the greatest thing he could do for us. He died for our sins and he paid the price for our transgressions. Isaiah 53 and verse 5 says, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. 
He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Friend, this is an absolute message of the gospel. This is the message of the gospel. God loved you so much that he gave his only son for you. That he would come and he would take the penalty of sin for you. He would take death so we could have life. Jesus Christ loves you and I that much. You know, receiving grace is wonderful. The release of God's grace into our lives is so powerful. But often what many struggle with is learning to live in grace. Here's what I mean. The Bible tells us that when Christ forgives us, he does it freely, he does it fully, and he does it finally. It's a free gift. It's undeserved favor for all the things you and I have done. It's free for the asking. It's free, friend. He's paid the price for you and me. Not only is it free, but he forgives us fully. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us of our sin and purify us. Here's the good word. From all, somebody say all. all. From all unrighteousness. Psalm 103 and verse 12, for as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Not only does he forgive us fully, but he forgives us finally. Isaiah 43 and 25, I, yes, I alone blot out your sins for my own sake. Notice this, and I will never think of them again. Boy, isn't that a good scripture? That's one of those you want to write down and put it up someplace where you see it all the time. I will never think of them again. Isaiah 44, 21 and 22. I, the Lord, made you and I will not forget you. I swept away your sins like a cloud and I have scattered your offenses like the morning mist. It's an incredible miracle. It's an incredible blessing in our lives. The Bible says that God forgives us and he forgets what we have done. But for so many, they struggle with the thought of living in his grace. They battle with the spirit of unworthiness. They battle in not forgiving themselves, not letting go of the past. Their past seems to haunt them. Their transgressions always seem to be before them. My friend, God's plan and God's desire for your life and my life is not only to extend grace to us, but to enable you and I to learn to live in that grace. Turn with me this morning to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. That's where we're going to find our text this morning, 1 Timothy chapter number 1. We're going to be in verses 12 through 16, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Beginning in verse number 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Now friend, there's a call, there's a plan that God has for your life. God's plan for your life, friend, is bigger than your past. God's plan for your life is not stifled because you have a past. How many of you in this room have a past? How many of you were alive yesterday? If you were alive yesterday, you've got a past. I'm so thankful to know today that the destiny and the plan that God has for our lives is not limited to my yesterday. I'm glad he doesn't look at yesterday and say, oh, I can't do anything with you The word says, he appointed me, speaking of Paul, he appointed me to his service. Friend, we may only see our inabilities. We may only see our failures. But God sees us through his son, Jesus Christ. And through his son, all things are possible to them that believe. Friend, I want to declare to you today that your life has purpose in Jesus Christ. He can give beauty for ashes. 
He can take brokenness, shattered dreams, and restore. Look at verse 13. Even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. Paul's saying he's called me, even though I have a past. Not only, not just any past, but a past where I was fighting against him. Paul said I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor of his people, I was a man of violence against his work. We know Paul as the great man of faith. We know him to be the man through whom the Holy Spirit brought us most of the New Testament. But Paul has a past. Look at verse 14. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. I'm so glad he pours things out on us abundantly, aren't you? Along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Grace. It was abundant in Paul's life. I would declare to you today, friend, grace is still abundant for you and grace is still abundant for me. It's not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His heart, his passion for people is the same as it's always been. I declare to you today, his grace is still greater than all our sin. It's his grace. Scripture says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Grace has been abundant to each and every one of us. And we are examples. The truth is today, as you've come to church, you've come to this house of worship. And you're not here because you say, you know what, well, you know, I decided one day to get saved and I decided to turn my life around and I, I decided to be the good person that I am and I decided all these things. Let me tell you, we are here today. Our testimony, our life is a testimony of the grace of Jesus Christ. Because friends, if it had been left up to me, I would have ruined it a long time ago. In fact, I did. That's why I needed grace. You and I today are here. When you come during worship, as I, as I looked across the building, and there were men and women with hands lifted up, worshiping. Friends, that's a picture of the grace of God. I'm here today because his grace has been abundant in my life and in your life. Verse 15, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. There's a realization of Paul's past. There's a realization of the severity of what he's done. Paul says, I am the worst of sinners. You know, in our world today, people say, well, I'm just as good as you are. I'm not as bad as you are. Paul doesn't go down that road at all. Paul just says, listen, I don't care what you've done. I'm the worst. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. I've been more. Whatever sin you've done, I've done more. I am the worst. It's almost like he was the poster child of the worst of sinners. He was the one who would have been declared and defined as the worst of all of us. Paul says, I know what I am. I remember what I've done. I'm sure that Paul could remember standing holding the coats of the men who stoned Stephen that day. And I'm sure he could remember standing there watching Stephen die. I'm sure that he could remember the cries of the believers that he persecuted and imprisoned for their faith in Jesus Christ. 
He could remember all the terrible things he had done to families and followers of Jesus. King David experienced a similar thing. He said in Psalm 38 and 4, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a burden that is too heavy for me to bear. Psalm 40 and 12, he said, my sins have overtaken me and I cannot see for they are more than the hairs on my head and my heart fails within me. He said again in Psalm 51 and 3, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Paul says, I'm the worst of sinners. But look at verse 16. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul says, in being the worst of sinners, I'm an example for you that you could see the mercy and the grace and the patience of our God. Aren't you glad today for his patience? Oh, I'm so glad he's been patient with me. A lot of others would have given up on me a long time ago, but he's been patient with me. He's been long-suffering with me. His mercies, they have been fresh and new in my life every morning. Paul says, in being the worst of sinners, he did that so that my life would be an example. My friend, if he can forgive Paul, if he can show mercy and grace to Paul, if he can take Paul's past and yet mightily use Paul, friend, what can he do in your life? What can he do in your life? This morning, I want to, for a few moments together, I want to challenge you with a couple of thoughts. That, friend, if we're going to learn to live in his grace, there's some things that are going to have to change. Because the truth is, I have a past, and you have a past. And the truth is, this is the difficult part of the truth. There's nothing you can do about the past. You can't go back. How many of us, oh, there's areas in our life, we we just wish we could go back and do that thing different. You know, years ago when we had cassette tape players and everybody had those kids, you won't have any idea what I'm talking about probably for the next few minutes, but that's okay. You could put that cassette tape in and you could record somebody And then you could go back to the beginning and start recording again and it'd just go over like it never existed before. You and I have things in our life that we wish we could go back and do over again, but we cannot. Jesus Christ has forgiven us. His grace, his mercy has been applied, but so often we are like Hallie in the illustration earlier, a year Five years, ten years down the road, we're still saying, God, I'm sorry for that thing way back then. God, can you ever forgive me? Can you ever release me from that thing? Friend, I want to share with you some thoughts this morning on how we can begin to live in his grace. Not just accept it, but to live in the blessing, and it really is a blessing. To live in the blessing of undeserved favor. First thing I would share with you is this. We have to change our thoughts. we got to change our thoughts. We must begin to feed on God's thoughts and not our thoughts. We have to start thinking about this sin issue the way that God does and not the way that you and I do. We have to understand that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He freely gives us his grace. In fact, in Micah 7 and 8, the Bible says that he delights. This this passage is such a blessing. He delights in showing mercy. 
So often we only get the picture that God is ready to snag you. That God is kind of sitting up on, uh, up on the throne in heaven and he's got his supply of lightning bolts. And he's just waiting for you to step over that little bit and he's going to zap you really good. Friend, that is not the picture of God. The Bible says that he's the kind of God, he delights, he delights in showing mercy. You know, even as a parent, you'll find there's times when your kids are kind of going the wrong way. When they're going the wrong way, don't you get excited when they come back home? Don't you get excited when they come and say, you know what, there's a change I need to make in my life. There's some changes I need to go on. You get excited. You delight. Showing them mercy. Friends, if you and I love our kids that much, how much more does our Heavenly Father love us? And how much more does He delight in showing mercy to His people? God delights in releasing you and I from our past. We need to begin to start rehearsing His words. Proverbs 3 and 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. How many of you know your own understanding will get you in trouble sometimes? Don't lean on your own understandings, but in all your ways acknowledge him. The translation says submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Listen, friend, in this area of grace, you and I are going to have to submit to what he says. And grace says you are forgiven. Grace says he delights in showing mercy to you. Grace says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. One of my favorite passages, we read it earlier, as far as the east is from the west. So far as he removed my transgressions from me. Sometimes we get the idea that it's like the old ball and chain. It doesn't matter where I go, that past is always attached to me. But the Bible says he'll take your past and he will hurl it, the Bible says, into the sin of forgetfulness. And he will choose not to think of them again. Your thoughts may say that you're not worthy, that you don't uh, deserve to be forgiven. Look at the mess you've made. Others have not been as bad of a person as you've been. But that's not what God says. He says, I will forgive you, and I will forget your sins, and I will release you from them. Friend, let me ask you a question today. If God's not holding your past against you, why are you? If the almighty God chooses not to remember them anymore, why are you still walking in guilt and in shame? He forgives us completely. Have you ever had imaginations? Anybody ever daydream? You ever have one of the imaginations where you have all the money in the world? You ever have those days where you think, what would I buy? You start thinking, I buy this, I buy that. I... You daydream. Maybe it's while you're at work and you're not supposed to be daydreaming, but yet you have these imaginations going on. You ever woke up in the middle of the night from a scary dream and you're laying in the house and it's dark and it's quiet and everybody else is sound asleep and your eyes are open about this big? And you hear a little sound at the other house. And your mind begins to imagine what it is. It's not a little sound. It's somebody really big. And they're coming through the door. And they're going to get you. This is it. It's all over right now. Imaginations. Sometimes our imaginations, how many of you know, can get running away and take us long places we ought not to be. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 to cast down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Friend, listen to me. If you don't control your mind, your mind will control you. It is the battle for the mind where the enemy gives his greatest battles. 
When you're condemned by your thoughts, remind yourself that Romans 8 and 1 says, so there is no, somebody say no. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. You may want to write that one down, put it on your phone, make it the wallpaper and phone. So every time you open up your phone, it says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. No condemnation, no matter what my past is. No condemnation. No matter what I've done or what I've said or who I've been, no condemnation need to remind yourself that you are saved. You are under the blood. You are born again. You're redeemed from your past. Friend, you must cast down every imagination. Secondly, I would tell you today, you and I are going to have to learn to trust grace. We need to learn to trust grace. You've got to settle the matter. Listen to me, friend. If you had never done anything more than just being born you would still need God's grace. It's not what you've done that made you a sinner. What you did just gave proof to the fact that you and I are sinners. You didn't need grace because of what you've done. You and I needed grace because of who we are. Listen, friend, you've never been worthy enough. I've never been worthy enough. There's no one who's good enough. Now, I know we kind of we get the idea that, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I go to church on Sunday, and I, I do all the things I'm supposed to do, and I obey the speed limit, and I pay my taxes, and I pay my bills on time, and I help out my neighbor when I can. How many of you know sometimes we can get a pretty good opinion of ourselves? You know, I'm not like the other guy at the end of the row. I'm way better than he is. We get a pretty good opinion of ourselves in the process of life. But the Bible says this about every single one of us. Isaiah 64 and 6, our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Listen, the best you've got, the best I've got is never enough. Listen, the best that I have to offer is like filthy rags outside of Jesus Christ. The best that I have will never be enough. So where where does that leave me? Because there's nothing I can do about my past. There's nothing I can do to change the circumstances. What can I I can only trust his grace. I can only trust his undeserved, I love that word, undeserved favor. So all I can do is trust it. I've got to put my confidence in it. Listen. Let grace be stronger in your life than your past. Let God's grace have more power. Let God's grace have more time in your thinking process than your past does. Trust grace to get you through. Number three, we've got to resist our enemy. We must resist our enemy. The Bible calls him the accuser of the brethren. When tempted and tried and he failed with Jesus, listen, we find him in the great temptation doing all that he can to get the Son of God off track. Friend, if he'll go after Jesus, where does that leave you and I? Don't forget the fact he's the devil and he is a liar, the Bible says, and he is even the origin, the father of all lives. If he's telling you that you are not forgiven and he's the father of lies, what it must mean is that you're forgiven fully. The only antidote for a lie is the truth. So when he begins to speak his lies, the only way you can respond is by speaking the truth. If he's telling you that you're not worthy to be saved, that must mean according to scriptures that now you and I have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He's a liar. Remember that the truth will overcome him when he comes to accuse you. We overcome him the same way. That Jesus did, James 4 and 7 says, so humble yourselves before God, resist, 
resist the devil and he will flee from you. Anybody in this room stubborn? Don't be, don't be elbowing your neighbor. Yeah, some of y'all are going, yeah, yes, they are. <laughs> stubborn. There's something about a stubborn nature that wants to resist. Some of the first words that come from our children, we say, go do this, and they say, no. I'm just going to leave that one alone. I'm not going to go any farther with that one. <laughs> There's something inborn in us that wants to resist. But friend, when it comes to this issue of grace, and it comes to this issue, we have somebody who's accusing us, who's lying, we somehow just kind of back up. The Bible says what you and I need to do is resist him. Resist him. Resist him. When he says you're not worthy, I don't care. I'm forgiven. When he says you're never going to be anything in God because God knows what you've done. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed my transgressions from me. You're never going to amount to anything. That's right, in myself I won't, but in him, his grace is sufficient, and he will help me to be exactly what he's created me to be. Friends, you got to resist. Now listen, some folks say, well, I'll just think it in my mind. There's some days, some folk may think I'm crazy, but I could be going along, and I, I have conversations. The enemy starts fighting me in my mind. Has he ever fought you in your mind? Starts fighting me there in my mind, and I just like, you know what? It's you got to go. There's some days I'll be like, you got to shut up. I'm tired of it. You see, when we resist something, usually we take some action, we speak some words, we we uh, put some motion to it. Friend, listen, don't don't just get the idea of my resisting. I'm sitting over in a in a chair in the corner, and I'm just quietly just resisting. Man, there's sometimes you got to take some action. Whether that's getting down on your knees and praying, whether that's getting the word out, filling your mind with the word of God, whether that's joining with a brother or sister and having them pray with you and believe with you, or that may be you declaring the word of God that you already know and making those things verbal in your situation. Listen, you've got to resist him. You've got to resist him. You've got to resist him. Don't take his stuff. Resist him. Don't listen to his lies. Resist him. Resist him. Resist. How many of y'all ever got angry about something and you resisted? Y'all in church on Sunday. Eh? No, I have no idea what you're talking about, Pastor. I'm a little upset and I, I'm not going to, and you can't make me do it. How many of y'all know that comes pretty natural to all of us? Listen, you do not have to fall prey to the lies of the enemy. You know why? Because you're a child of the Most High God. Your Father is over our enemy. <laughs> our enemy doesn't have one up on our Father. Our Father is the King. Our Father is the God of all gods, the Almighty One, and you are His sons and daughters. You have been redeemed. You've been brought into the family. He has made you His very own. Through the grace, through the grace, through the grace of Jesus Christ, you must resist our enemy. Would you bow your heads? Father, I'm so thankful today. I'm so thankful, Lord, for your mercy that you've given to us. I'm so thankful today. Oh, God. I'm so thankful today for your grace. Lord, may I never forget your grace. May I never lose sight of what your grace can do in my life. May I not be overwhelmed by my past. But, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus we'd be overwhelmed by grace. We'd be overwhelmed by your grace. 
overwhelmed by your love for us, overwhelmed by your kindness, overwhelmed, 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 saturated in your grace. Oh, Heavenly Father, would you minister your grace today to your people? Would you minister it now in Jesus' name? With all heads bowed and hearts of prayer. Friend, today His grace is sufficient for you. Maybe you've come to this church and you say, Preacher, you don't understand what I've done. God can never forgive me for what I've done. You don't know the things I've done and the harm that I've caused. God can never forgive me. Friend, I may not know every detail, but God himself declares that he will forgive all our sins. There's not one that's so bad he can't forgive. Not one that he won't exempt. He'll forgive us from all our sin. So this morning as you walked into this room today, if you say, you know what, I need the forgiveness of Jesus Christ in my life. I need his grace. Maybe, friend, you're at the point you have hit the bottom been trying to fix it and you've come to the realization I can't fix it anymore and you say I need God's grace his forgiveness in my heart and life friend if that's you would you just lift your hand up right where you're at all heads are bowed I'm not going to embarrass you yes I, mean, I just need his forgiveness yes 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 I need his forgiveness in my life. I need his forgiveness in my heart. How many others? Yes. Yes. Right where we're at. Friend, this is a thing of faith thing of faith right where you're at I want to just lead us in a prayer and I want you to pray this prayer right now meet it in your heart because I'm telling you his word is true he'll fulfill it all across this room would everybody pray this with me dear Lord Jesus I need your forgiveness today I can't do anything about it but bring it to you Would you please forgive me? Would you cleanse me? Would you wash me? Would you throw my sin away? Would you bring in your mercy and your grace to my life? In this moment, I receive your forgiveness in this moment I accept your forgiveness and I believe that you have released me from my past in Jesus name Amen now to those of you who are in this room I think it is, I'll be honest with you, I think it's common for us to wrestle as believers with, man, there's something that's transpired and it keeps kind of coming to the forefront of your mind. And if you're like me, you find it comes at the oddest times. I won't even be thinking about that. Bam, it's there. And then this feeling of guilt and this feeling of shame comes over. But friend, listen to me. 
if you have already confessed that thing to Jesus, he's forgiven you. He's washed you. He's cleansed you. And you're free from that. So would you please stand with me all across the room? Because I, I believe this is so common for all of us. I want to pray this morning for all of us. Friend, I want to remind you again, he loves you with an everlasting love. God, God loves you more than you can even begin to fathom. God has not given up on you. God's not wrote you off. Sometimes we think, wow, God, you know, when I read the scripture earlier about him delighting in releasing us from our past, sometimes we think God just tolerates me. God just puts up with me because he has to. No. That's not the Father today that we serve. He loves you with an everlasting love and he will continue loving you. Friend, there's nothing you can do that will stop him from loving you. Nothing you've done can stop him from loving you. So I wanna pray today. I wanna pray for you just with faith and a heart of acceptance, would you bow your heads today? Father in heaven, I come to you today, Father, not because I deserve to even be able to call on you. Father, I humbly stand before you and these people today, and I call on you as my heavenly Father. Father, I there are days that I struggle with past decisions that you've redeemed me from, past things I've done that are still in my memory banks. Lord, as I'm sure my friends here today wrestle with as well. And Father, you know each of us individually and you know us by name and so you know, you know the thoughts, you know the past, you know everything about it. But Lord, you have redeemed us from it. And you have said in your word that you choose not to think about them anymore. You choose to let them go. God, I pray for those today. In the name of Jesus, I curse the spirit of unworthiness. I curse the lying spirits that would work to tear down, discourage, and destroy the body of believers. I cast down every imagination in the name of Jesus. I cast it down in the name that is above every name. Cast down lies of our enemy. Cast down false things that our enemy is declaring about us. In the name of Jesus Christ, he that the Son sets free is free indeed. Father, today I ask you, God, would you just come today in a special way? Lord, I thank you for all the other days you miss her, but right now in this moment, Father, would you come and work in a special way? Would you remind every person in this room, Father, how much you love them and how much you care for them? Would you remind them today that you paid the ultimate price just for them because you loved us so much? Help them, Father, as they battle the enemy. Strengthen their heart. Strengthen their mind. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you bring back to memory the scriptures that have been planted in their heart as they resist the enemy. I pray, God, you'll bring up a great resistance in the heart of your people. I pray a great resistance would start against the enemy of our souls. Raise up an army of resistors in Jesus' name. Raise up a mighty army. A mighty army 
a mighty army of the trophies of grace. A mighty army of the forgiven, the redeemed, the blood bought. Father, in the name of Jesus, raise up a mighty army of men and women that'll say, no more lies. Now, Father, last of all, I pray today, I pray the blessing of grace. I pray the spirit of freedom that's found in grace would come to their hearts and their minds and their lives. Father, would you just come in, Holy Spirit, come in and comfort the body today. Let grace reign. Let grace be triumphant in their heart and in their life. Father, I ask all these things knowing that you do hear us when we pray. You're listening for us today. And knowing, Father, that you do answer our prayers. And I believe you're going to answer this prayer today. So, Father, I speak the blessing of grace over them. The blessing of grace over their mind. Their mind is blessed with the grace of Jesus Christ. Their emotions are blessed with the grace of Jesus Christ. Their past is blessed with the grace of Jesus Christ. And their future is blessed by the grace of our Heavenly Father. Lord, I ask it all today in the name of Jesus. I ask it all in the name that is above every name. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen and amen. So be it. So be it in the name of the Lord. Friends, learn to live. Learn to live in His grace. Now, I would like to encourage you all. Today is our church picnic. And I would like to encourage you to come and join us at the Gas City Park. Uh, when you head down there, you may see a sign that says the road is closed. It is not closed at the park. It's beyond the park. So you can still get down there. We're going to have lots of food. I need y'all to help me. We don't have anybody take home the food when it's over. So y'all need to come and help us eat it. We're going to have a great day of fellowship. We love to have the opportunity to rub shoulders with you and just share fellowship with you today. We love y'all so much. So grateful for each of you. Pray God's best on your life today. God bless. In freedom, 